You're on a big uh, tour, I guess, now, and uh, I wanted to ask you about comments you made about the 2018 election, and we were just talking to two pollsters about it, and I honestly think that this election is going to be about Democrats want to impeach Donald Trump, they don't want to build the wall, they want to keep Obamacare, and they want to take back the tax cuts that President Trump gave every American. I don't think that's exactly a platform that is is lending itself to maximize success. No, look, I, I think, first of all, thank you for all the help you've been uh, with my new book, Trump's America, and, and our effort to explain how much he is accomplishing and how much most Americans are accomplishing. But the Democrats are going crazy. I, I, I mentioned to you uh, yesterday this Minnesota State Convention where the left wing of the Democratic Party just took over the whole party, uh, ran over all of the traditional establishment people, uh, have nominated folks so far to the left that they have no possibility of winning, virtually guarantee that uh, Governor Tim Pawlenty is going to win the governorship again. We may well, in the process, pick up three House seats. I mean, uh, Minnesota is a good example of what's going on. John Cox out in uh, California today, I think, is going to get into the runoff against the lieutenant governor. And John Cox is going to make a huge difference as the Republican nominee because the California Democrats have raised the gasoline tax. It's almost $5 a gallon in parts of California now. And they have uh, and, and uh, Gavin Newsom, the Democrat, is campaigning on a promise to raise your income tax, raise property taxes, uh, and, and dramatically increase the cost of government in a state which already has the highest cost of living in the country. So I think uh, John Cox... By the way, if he does make it, as I think he will, that probably increases Republican turnout this fall in California by maybe as much as 23 percent. That virtually guarantees the Democrats can't pick up seats in California. And we may actually pick, pick up uh, two or three House seats out there. So everywhere I look, uh, I think what you're going to get is a red wave, not a blue wave. And I think things are continuing to build. There's an article today, one last thing. <laughs> But for the first time, I can remember there are more job vacancies than there are people looking for work. Uh, that is astonishing. Can I just say, I mean, this 500 days has been maybe the most fascinating 500 days of any presidency. And, and of course, the cloud that the Democrats and the media, they're now in a position. This, to me, is the most damning position for them to be in. And that is that with the economy now turned around... Record low unemployment in 14 states, record low unemployment for women, uh, Hispanic Americans, African Americans. Uh, you see, regulation is literally has now been totally eliminated, and we're now incentivizing businesses to come back, and people have more money back in their pocket. Now, the only way that I see the Democrats can win is if they somehow convince the American people that Donald Trump colluded with the Russians, and he did not or that somehow uh, he's bad for the country, and now the polls out today show 70% of Americans think the economy's good because of him. Yeah, look, I, I think that their problem gets bigger and bigger. And uh, I would say, that the, as somebody who's been active in the Republican Party uh, for a very, very long time, I worry as much about the Republicans as about the Democrats, because the Republicans are historically just bad politicians, uh, and, and they, they don't get it. If Republicans have the guts to go out and appeal to every American of every background, I mean, when you're in a situation where you have the lowest black unemployment in American history, every Republican candidate should be in the black community saying, look, uh, isn't this better to have people with jobs rather than on food stamps? Isn't it better to have a chance to, to rise because you get that first job, then you get promoted, then you get another job, then one day you open up your own small business? Um, you know, that's what America is all about. And we have a chance. Trump is giving us a chance to have a head on argument between socialism. You know, the, 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 the people on the left uh, who can't explain Venezuela, can't explain the Soviet Union, can't explain Cuba, but have these fantasy ideas that if only we had big enough government. And this is what uh, Gavin Newsom is going to be a great experiment on. He's he's running on a government takeover of health care in California, which would bankrupt the state. Uh, but we ought to be doing this across the whole country. So if you would do, say to Donald Trump, one of the states you really ought to be campaigning in is California this midterm absolutely. election season. Absolutely. I, I, I believe, and I know people will say I'm crazy, but you and I have been down this road together over the years as, as good friends. 
I believe that the Democrats reach tilt they, they, in, in California. They passed a state sanctuary law, which keeps, which, which in effect would allow MS-13 to continue to, to rape and kill and murder and torture people in California. They passed a gasoline tax increase that was massive when they already have the most expensive gasoline in the country. They have a candidate for governor who spent the last eight years in Sacramento, and he wants to uh, raise their, says openly, He's campaigning on a promise of raising their taxes. Uh, and I think John Cox, with enough resources, enough help, has a chance uh, to, to do to California what Trump has done to the country and to do it exactly the same way, to go out to all of California, get every single person who's fed up with it. Sixty-five percent of Californians in a poll last week said California was now too expensive. Uh, and if you know Cox can become the guy who wants to lower the cost of living in California, while well, Newsom's the guy who wants to raise your taxes, I think you could see a Republican governorship. Uh, and with it, uh, we virtually guarantee enough House members get elected that Kevin McCarthy probably becomes You know, the next for week. those that might doubt that this could happen in California, I would just only point out states like New Jersey and Christy Todd Whitman and then later Chris Christie and New York Governor Pataki. And, and there are examples after example where really deeply blue states have had it. They just get fed up. Uh, and I think the well, very issues you're describing here could create a condition in California where, you know, look, look Arnold Schwarzenegger won and, and Pete Wilson had won. I mean, it's going back a ways. But, right. um, and, I think well, and, and look at what's happening around the country. The most popular governor in America today is Charlie Baker, who's a Republican in Massachusetts. Uh, governor Hogan's almost certainly going to get reelected in Maryland. You, you, if, if, if people believe you're trying to improve their lives, and people believe you're honest. I mean, just the act of not being corrupt is such a big advantage over Democrats in some states uh, that, that you really have some breakthrough opportunities. And by the way, you mentioned New Jersey. One of the reasons I think there's going to be a red wave, not a blue wave, uh, is I think we're going to beat Menendez in New Jersey after all of his ethics problems. Uh, you, you can't be losing New Jersey and have any hope of Schumer picking up a majority in the Senate. So we're going to gain seats in the Senate. And I keep saying to people, you're going to have a red wave in the Senate. You're probably going to have a red wave for governor. And I think we have a fair chance that we're going to keep the House and maybe even at the margins do better than people expect. Uh, so show me where the blue wave is going to come. Well, I mean, that's such a good point. Now, with that said, the House to me is very, very key and crucial. And I think the message is simple. I think you take the Trump success story and you take the economic success story. I would add two things between now and November, though. I would fund the border wall. And the second thing that I would do is I'd take another crack at repeal and replacing. And I think Republicans, you know, they've been hesitant to do to follow up on that one big promise, although we did get rid of the individual mandate as part of the tax package. But I think, you know, basically this has been the force of Trump, not the force of Republicans, especially in the Senate. Oh, I think I think that's right. But I, I guess I'm a little more cheerful than you are about all this. I do think he has to keep pushing on the wall and he will. And he's going to, you know, they began opening the first new section in San Diego this last week. You know, and then I, and I know, as you do, how really determined he can be. And he's gradually going to win that fight. I think we are, uh, Secretary Azar is doing a great job at Health and Human Services, and we're gradually going to keep taking apart Obamacare and replacing it with a much more uh, market-oriented and choice-oriented system that will be better for people. And I think that these are important steps in the right direction. Uh, but I also think this, this central question is really simple. Would you like to have more jobs or would you like to have an impeachment? Would you like to have a Congress that works to have an even better economy or would you like to have a Congress that does nothing all the time except fight Trump? Do you really agree with, with Nancy Pelosi that we need to raise taxes? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, we have a chance here to win a decisive election in ways that would have been unthinkable six months ago. Well, it was a 17-point deficit. In one poll, even went to a, a six-point-plus advantage in the in terms of the generic ballot polling. Uh, I, I know that you know this better than anybody. There's very few people. You Maybe Mike Barone understands the whole history of every county in every, every single part of uh, the United States, from Cuyahoga County to Hamilton County and everything in between, and certainly knows all the counties in Florida, North Carolina, and all these swing states. 
But I, I do remember distinctly sitting in a meeting with you and, and Joe Gaylord years ago before you became speaker. And you guys went through district by district by district. So the fact that you think that California should take on such uh, in, incredible importance needs to be paid attention to. No, I, I think so. And I, and I think they will pay attention to it because, you know, it's, it's, look, I wouldn't be saying this if it was just a typical environment. But but uh, when I saw them pass the gas tax increase, and I saw the survey that said two out of every three Californians now think the state's too expensive, uh, I could feel, much as I did back in 1978 with Prop 13, uh, you, there are moments when you can feel this stuff coming together. And I just think that John Cox has a great chance in California to, to run a, a much more successful race. You mark my word, tomorrow morning the elite media will all be writing him off saying he doesn't have a chance. And just remember, these are the same people who wrote off uh, Donald Trump. Well, I know, and that's what makes this such an amazing election. Uh, New Kingrich is with us, and he's on his official book tour. It's in stores as of today. He'll be at uh, Bookends in Ridgewood, New Jersey, if you're in the New York, New Jersey area, giving a speech and a book signing tonight. And uh, one of the great bookstores in the entire country, and independently owned, they're great people, Trump's America, and uh, how we are making America great again, and how it's successful. And, uh, by the way, that's an untold story. The media is avoiding at all costs. All right, as we continue, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich is with us. Why won't the media talk about the 500 days of success? Well, because, let's, let's be fair, most of the elite media is so traumatized by Hillary's defeat and Donald J. Trump's presidency that, and, and he further, you know, every morning he gets up and he tweets, and as they wake up that morning, they're reminded, oh, my God, he's still president. Uh, so you're asking people who are tormented by the failure of the perfect liberal to become president, uh, people who were, were constantly, these, these, are, these are reporters and commentators who are going to break out the champagne at 8 o'clock on election night, and now here they are faced day after day with the fact that, that Donald J. Trump is president, and it just drives them crazy. Uh, and then they get together at their cocktail parties, and they reinforce each other's craziness. Well, well, I mean, yeah, and I think so, and I just think, but on top of all of that, then you got this cloud that, you know, hovers over the president, he's annoyed by it, I'm annoyed by it, you're annoyed by it, there's been no evidence of collusion, but there is great evidence of corruption at the highest levels of the DOJ and the FBI, and, you know, for example, I'm, we're expecting an IG report, and it's not coming, but we know the DOJ's had a copy now for two weeks, and that's problematic. Well, that's right, and, and you and I have talked about this before. Well, you have five different parallel scandals underway, uh, and I believe that, that the, the sickness of the system, when, it, when it's fully laid out, people are shocked how truly corrupt and how truly fundamentally dishonest the system was uh, and how many of these players are really bad people. And uh, it's really, really unfortunate. And, and uh, I, I shocked, I, I did the view today, which is quite an experience, and I shocked him because one said to me, well, are you saying that the Justice Department is corrupt? And I said, yes, I'm saying the Justice Department is corrupt. And they, you could just see that it was kind of like, oh, my God, how could we have this conversation? Uh, but it's true, and I think if people uh, would, would look at Sidney Powell's book on license to lie about two of the major cases and realize that the, or the, the key person who did wrong in the Enron case is on the staff of Mueller, a person who was repudiated 9-0 to zero by the Supreme Court for falsifying evidence. Uh, I think people need to look at this stuff. I, I did, by the way, I watched last night uh, Molly Bloom, which is a very interesting movie about about a woman who was running a, a uh, poker game and, and her relationship with the FBI and the way the FBI set her up. And it's worth watching because it, it, it tells you a lot about the pressures and the, and the maneuvering and the way in which they try to, to blackmail people and gives you a sense of what Mueller's doing to some people to try to force them into uh, testifying. Right, we're going to have to end it there. Book, in, book ends tonight. Uh, New Kingrich speech and, of course, his brand new book that is out uh, on top of his last bestseller. It's called Trump's America and the, the definitive guide on how we are making America great again and the media doesn't want to tell the story. Uh, Mr. Speaker, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to see you tonight on TV. That's correct. We'll see you on Hannity tonight at 9 after your book signing. Can't wait to see you.